Hi, it's Miss Lisa from the St. Paris Public Library. Welcome back to night two this week of our Just Before Bed chapter book uh, reading program. We are going to continue on reading The Fantastic Secret of Owen Jester. And we're going to start tonight in chapter seven. Owen stepped back and admired the cage. It was perfect. The boys had rolled out a piece of chicken wire and bent it into a large rectangle shape. Then they used the wire cutters that Travis had taken from his father's toolbox to cut two pieces of chicken wire for the top and the bottom of the cage. Since they didn't have a staple gun, and no way were they going to borrow one from Viola's fly-eyed brother Jarvis, they used baling wire to attach a tomato stake to each end of the each of the four corners. Next, they attached the bottom securely all around the edges. They attached the, loose, the top loosely on one end so they could lift it up and, and down and open and close. They made a latch out of bent wire to hold the top closed. They tested it a few times, opening and closing the top, hooking and unhooking the latch. Owen had never seen a finer cage. Tooley was going to love it. Tooley's going to love it, Owen said. Travis and Stumpy nodded. Now, all we have to do is put, in, put it in the water, Owen said, and walked out onto the rickety dock and inspected the pond. He squinted into the murky water. Wonder how deep it is here, he said. Stumpy tossed a rock into the pond. Ploink! It disappeared out of sight. Owen pulled a tomato steak out of the wheelbarrow. He walked to the edge of the dock and put the steak into the water until he felt the squishy mud on the bottom of the pond. He inched along the edge of the dock, poking the stake into the water till he could no longer feel the bottom. This is where it starts getting deeper, he said. We should put the cage here. He poked the stick into the pond some more, stirring up the muddy bottom. One end can be in the shallow part so Tooley can get out of the water, and one end can be in the deeper part so he can swim around. So the boys sat on the dock and planned how they would position the cage in the pond. They debated which side of the dock was best and how deep the cage would be in the water or, and whether or not they should attach it to the dock with wire. But before they could start carrying out their plans, a voice interrupted the still summer air, a dreaded voice, Viola's voice. Owen! Owen looked at Travis and Travis looked at Stumpy and Stumpy looked at Owen. Dang, Owen said. What she want, Travis said. Let's hide, Stumpy said. Owen! Viola's voice drifted through the trees up from Owen's house. We better get up there and see what she wants, or she's liable to come down here, Owen said. Nah, Travis said. She hates it here. But Owen wasn't taking any chances. Let's go, he said. The boys raced up the path through the woods. When they got to Owen's backyard, Viola was sitting under the stairs beside the frog house. What are you doing here, Owen said. Earlene's looking for you. She pushed on at her glasses and peered into the plastic tub beside her. Your frog looks terrible, she said. Go away, Owen said. Yeah, go away, Travis said. Stumpy kicked at the dry dirt of the yard, sending dust and pebbles in Viola's direction. Viola stood up and wiped dirt off of her shorts. Is that water from the pond? She said, pointing at the tub of water Tooley sat in, his big yellow eyes staring up out of the dirty water. Owen pushed his irritation down, 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 trying hard not to let it come bursting out like it wanted to. Why is Ear Earlene looking for me, he said. You should put water from the pond in there. Viola brushed past the boys and skipped towards the hedge. Then she turned around and said, Earlene knows you took the wheelbarrow out of the barn and you left the shed door open and who in the world told you you could have that chicken wire? Then she knelt down and crawled through the hole in the hedge, disappearing into her own backyard. Let's go back and put the cage in the pond, Owen said. But just as the boys reached the edge of the yard, thunder rumbled. Rain began to fall in big, slow drops. Plunk, plunk, plunk. And then the sky turned dark, lightning flashed, and the rain poured down, drenching the boys and sending them scurrying for shelter. That night at supper, Owen told his parents about the frog cage while Erlene fumed by the stove. His father thought it was a great idea. His mother worried that the boys would fall in the pond. Erlene mumbled about the chicken wire belonging to her, his grandfather and that mangy stray cat getting in the shed when Owen left the door open. 
After supper, Owen took Tooley up to his bedroom and set him in the middle of the bed. Tooley did a little half jump, then settled down in the folds of the quilted bedspread. Owen inspected Tooley's froggy skin. He rubbed his fingers along Tooley's yellow throat. He examined Tooley's big webbed feet. He lifted Tooley and peered into his eyes. Then he put the bullfrog into the tub in the closet and sat on the bed and worried. Maybe Viola was right. Maybe he should have used water from the pond and in the tub instead of water from the hose. Owen sat still and listened. The rain pattered against the window. Thunder rumbled in the distance, but inside the bedroom, it was quiet. Owen sighed. Then he had the first, when he had first brought Tooley home, the frog had croaked all night long that deep rum sound that bullfrogs make. But now he was quiet. A flash of lightning lit up Owen's room. The rain beat harder against the window. Tomorrow, Owen thought. Tomorrow he had two things. One, get the frog cage into the pond so Tooley could move in, be happy. Two, find the thing had, that had fallen off the train. They still haven't found that thing that fell off the train. I don't think they've looked very hard, though. Chapter 8. Y'all get out of my yard, Jolene Burkus hollered through the screen door. Owen cupped his hand over a grasshopper in the weeds and glared at her. Anybody who would tear down a perfectly good fort was deserving of a glare. Owen wondered what she had done with that trap door he had sawed into the wooden floor of his old bedroom, or the ladder he and Jarvis and Stumpy had nailed to the back of the garage so they could climb up into the roof. I said get out of my yard, Jolene stormed out onto the porch and flapped a dish towel at the boys. Travis yanked a small green cantaloupe off a tangled vine beside the bird bath and tossed it towards the porch. It landed in the walkway with a thwunk. Before Jolene could stop down the, stomp down the steps, the boys were clear across the street and around the back of Stumpy's house, laughing so hard they could barely catch their breath. Then they jumped on their bikes and raced over to Owen's house. As Owen pedaled, clutching a jar of grasshoppers in one hand, his stomach flip-flopped with excitement. Today was the day they were going to put the cage in the pond. They had made all kinds of plans for Tooley's new house. It would attach to the side of the dock, one end in the shallow water and one end in the deeper water. There would be a log to sit on, on and rocks to hunker down beside and leaves to sleep on. Water bugs and crickets and flies would go right through the chicken wire, so Tooley would always have something tasty to snack on. And every once in a while, the boys would open the top of the cage and take Tooley out and play with him. It would be great. Let's go on down to the dock and start cutting the bailing wire, Owen said, after dropping two grasshoppers into the tub for Tooley. He retrieved the bailing wire and wire cutters from the shed, put them in a plastic grocery bag, and carefully closed the door behind him so Erlene wouldn't have anything to yammer about. Then he started across the yard with Jarvis and Stumpy behind him. But just as they got to the edge of the woods, Viola crawled through the hedge and said, You should catch crawfish. Owen sighed and rolled his eyes at Travis and Stumpy. Be quiet, Travis said. Yeah, be quiet, Stumpy said. Viola's, uh, Viola eyed the grocery bag in Owen's hand. What's that, she said. Nothing, Owen jiggled the bag at Viola. Your mother's calling you. He always says that to her. Bullfrogs love crawfish, Viola said, pushing out her glasses. I read it in the encyclopedia at my cousin's house. Crawfish, really? There were tons of crawfish in the creek beside Travis's house. Owen had caught about a million of them last summer. The boys had even had crawfish races and made trophies for the winners. You think you know everything, don't you, Travis said. I know that bullfrogs don't want names, and they want to. They don't want to live in cages, and they love to eat crawfish. Viola lunged for the grocery bag in Owen's hand, but he yanked it away before she could grab it. Go away, Viola, Owen hollered. Then he motioned for Travis and Stumpy to follow him and started down the path through the woods. After a few feet, he whirled around to see if Viola was following them. She wasn't. She was standing at the edge of the woods with that smug look on her smug face and sending irritating zipping down and sending irritation zipping down the path full steam ahead. She's going to follow us, Stumpy said. Nah, Owen said as he stomped down the path swinging the grocery bag. When she goes in the woods... She gets wheezy and itchy. Besides, she hates the pond. 
There's too many gnats and too much mud and poison oak and all. Owen hoped he was right, but with a girl like Viola, you never knew. There, Owen stood up and grinned down at the cage, the perfect cage, the cage where Tooley would live and be happy. Let's go get him, he said, and raced up the path through the woods into the yard and over to the back steps to the tub where Tooley sat, blinking up at the summer sky. Pete and Leroy leaped off the porch, tails wagging, and trotted over to join the fun. Owen lifted Tooley out of the tub. The back door opened and Erlene stepped out of the house and glared down at him. Her eyes darted from him to Tooley, to Travis, to Stumpy, and then to him again. You're not going back yonder to those train tracks, are you? She said. No, ma'am. She glared some more. You're not going out on that rotten old dock, are you? We're taking Tooley down to the pond, Owen said. He held Tooley out so his froggy legs dangled. Owen was a master of evasion. He could evade a question better than anybody he knew, but Erlene was persistent. You're not going out on that rotten old dock, are you? She asked again. Owen's mind raced. He was thinking that maybe he needed to sharpen his evasion skills. We put the cage in the pond for Tooley, he said. You loosen to me, Owen Jester, Earlene said. I'm in no mood to be fishing three drowned boys out of that snake-infested pond. Owen heard Travis and Stumpy shuffle in the dirt behind him. Travis and Stumpy were scared of Earlene. They always felt all, left all of the evading to Owen. Yes, ma'am, Owen said, because what else could he say? Erlene made herself, made a humph noise and pressed her lips together in a thin, hard line. Owen waited. Erlene went back in the house, letting the screen door slam be shut behind her. Owen and Travis and Stumpy and Pete and Leroy raced to the pond with Thule. Chapter 9 Owen lay on his stomach on the dock and peered into the murky water. Tooley sat on the bottom of the pond inside the perfect cage. Owen nudged him gently with a stick. Tooley swam to the other side of the cage and nestled back down into the squishy mud. He likes it, Owen grinned up at Travis and Stumpy. But inside, Owen, something was niggling at him. A teeny tiny niggle, barely noticeable, but a niggle nonetheless. The niggle was caused by a thought. The thought was this, maybe, just maybe, Tooley should not be in that perfect cage. Maybe he should be swimming freely around Graham Pond, gliding gracefully through the water, floating among the rotting oak leaves that had settled on the surface, sunning lazily on the moss-covered logs along the edges, instead of in a cage, even if the cage was perfect. Owen pushed the niggle away. Then he tossed the stick into the pond and said, Now we can go look for the thing that fell off the train. Travis and Stumpy let out a whoop. The three boys raced around the pond towards the rain train tracks. What's that? Travis said, pointing to a clump of weeds beside the tracks. Something shiny and round was nestled in among the prick prick prickery vines. Owen ran over and examined it. A hubcap. Shoot, he said, kicking at the weeds. The boys walked glumly along the sides of the tracks. Every now and then, one of them spotted something and would point and holler. They'd all race over to examine it, but it was never anything that seemed like it had fought, might have fallen off the train and made the noise that Owen had heard. The thud, the crack of wood, the tumble, tumble, tumble sound. Let's go to my house and get lunch, Stumpy said. So the boys headed back up the path through the woods, but they hadn't gotten far when Owen stopped. He snapped his fingers. Wait a minute, he said. Travis and Stumpy waited. Tumble, 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 Owen said. Travis and Stumpy waited some more. If something's tumbling, that means it's like rolling, Owen said. Travis and Stumpy waited some more. So that means that whatever was tumbling was probably going downhill, right? Travis and Stumpy looked at each other. Yeah, they both said. So, Travis said, so whatever fell off the train isn't up by the tracks where you've been, where we've been looking, but more downhill from the tracks, like in the bushes and stuff, Owen said. Travis and Stumpy nodded and grinned and high-fived Owen, and they all raced back to the tracks to search the bottom of the rocky, red dirt slopes that ran along the sides. 
They found a bicycle wheel with broken spokes. They found a bullet riddled stop sign. They found the bent up frame of an aluminum lawn chair. They found a mildewed mud covered sofa cushion. They found a grocery cart with two missing wheels. They found cinder blocks and broken bottles and rusty cans. I'm sick of this, Travis said. Yeah, Stumpy said. Me too. Owen's disappointment swirled around inside him and then settled with a heavy thunk in the pit of his stomach. Not me, he lied. I'm going home, Travis said. Me too, Stumpy said. Not me, Owen jammed his hands in his pockets and strolled off, studying the ground, peering into the weeds and bushes, kicking at clods of dirt, pretending like he didn't care that Travis and Stumpy were quitters. He glanced over his shoulder to see the two boys trotting up the tracks towards the path in the woods. Quitters, he muttered under his breath. Owen climbed back up the slope and scanned the bottom of the ravine on the other side of the tracks. It wasn't nearly as much fun searching without Travis and Stumpy. But Owen was not a quitter. While he searched, he thought about Thule, and the niggle he had had earlier that day came back. The more he thought, the bigger the niggle got. It grew and grew until it became a tangled-up mass of worry. And in the center of the tangled-up mass was the biggest worry of all. Maybe Thule really was sad. And then, just as Owen's stomach was beginning to ache, something caught his attention. Something big. Something red. Down among the tangled bushes and scrub pines at the bottom of the ravine beside the tracks. Owen hurried down the slopes, slipping and sliding on the loose dirt and rocks, pushing through the clumps of brush and weeds. And then he stopped. He stood in a gape-mouthed wonder. Whoa, he said out loud. The tangle of niggly worry in his stomach disappeared. Poof! Because lying there before him was the thing that had fallen off the train. Owen was sure of it. Chapter 10 Owen scrambled through the thick brush, ducking under low-hanging branches and climbing over rotting logs. Pricker scratched his legs and snagged his clothes as he made his way towards the thing. The thing that had fallen off the train. The thing that had made the thud. It was big and red and made of metal. But what was it? Next to it, jammed between two scraggly oak trees, was part of an enormous wooden crate. Scattered here and there among the brush and weeds surrounding it were pieces of wood splintered and broken. The crack of the wood. The red thing lay nestled at the bottom of the ravine where it had rolled down the slope from the railroad tracks. The tumble, tumble, tumble sound. One last push through the weeds and Owen was standing next to it, his mind racing. What was this thing? One end was round like the nose of an airplane. On the other end was a small propeller. On each side was a short, stubby wing. There was a small propeller on each stubby wing. This was an airplane. Owen didn't think so. The wings weren't big enough. There were no wheels, just a flat, box-shaped bottom. Besides it, beside it, besides, it was surely too small to be an airplane. Owen could stand on tiptoe and see right over the top of it. Then what was it? Owen walked around it, studying it carefully. There was an enclosed compartment with three large windows in the front and one round, bubble-shaped window on each side. In the back of the enclosed compartment was a hollowed-out space. Strapped inside the space were four large tanks, like the kind that scuba divers use. Ah, scuba divers. Painted on one side of the red thing, just under the bubble-shaped window, was a dolphin, a silvery dolphin swimming through blue ocean waves. Above the dolphin, in swirling black letters, was written, Water Wonder 4000. A submarine, Owen whispered. This red thing that had fallen off the train was a submarine. Owen peered through the windows. Inside was an instrument panel with a few glass-covered dials, some switches, and a joystick. In front of the instrument panel were two small seats, a submarine just big enough for two people. Owen had never seen anything like it. He ran his hands along the side of the submarine, feeling the smooth metal, tracing the dolphin, brushing dirt off the rounded nose up front, turning the little propeller in the back. He examined the top. 
There were a few dents here and there, some scratches in the shiny red paint, but other than that, the Water Wonder 4000 looked perfect. Owen's heart was racing. Wait, just wait, until Travis and Stumpy see this. Owen dashed across the yard towards the woods, followed by Travis and Stumpy. Pete and Leroy galloped along beside them, barking happily. Where are y'all going? Viola's voice sliced through the air. Owen stopped. Travis and Stumpy stopped. Pete and Leroy ran in circles around them. Owen's face twitched. His fingers fluttered. His feet bounced. Why, why, why did Viola always have to show up at the wrong time? He could hardly wait to show Travis and Stumpy the little red submarine. He had told them he'd found the thing that had fallen off the train, but he hadn't told them what it was. He wanted it to be a surprise. But now Viola was here, ruining everything like she always did. We're going to the pond to catch some snakes, Owen said. Want to come? Viola marched towards them, clomping across the yard in flower-rubbered rain boots. You are not, she said. We are too, Travis said. And then we're going to dig up some big, fat worms for Thule, those slimy gray ones that live in the mud down there by the pond. Viola narrowed her eyes and set her mouth in a thin, hard line. Fibber, she said. Owen couldn't keep still. He bounced from foot to foot. Come on with us, Viola, he said. You can stick your arm down in the water and touch Thule. If you're lucky, you won't get any leeches stuck on you. There's no leeches in that pond, Viola said. Owen made a little pfft sound and rolled his eyes. You think you know everything, but you don't, he said. He nodded towards Travis. Tell Viola about the leeches, he said. Travis stared at Owen. Owen winked a teeny tiny little wink and said, you know, the leeches. Oh, Travis said, you mean them nasty, slimy, squishy, juicy leeches that stick on you and suck all your blood out? Owen nodded, nodded solemnly. Yep, that's the ones. There's leeches down there, all right, Travis said. Gerald Asher's brother went fishing down there once and got a leech this big stuck on him. Travis held his hands out about a foot apart, then widened them a tad, then widened them a tad more until the leech was about a yard long. Stumpy snorted with laughter and Owen shot him a look. Y'all must think I'm stupid, Viola said, resting one hand on her hip and cocking her head. Her voice had that usual know-it-all sound to it, but Owen was delighted to see that she had turned a little pale. We might even feed some leeches to Thule, he said. Bullfrogs don't eat leeches, Viola said. Besides, that frog does not want to be named Thule. Trust me. She brushed a strand of hair out of her face and added, and he should not be living in a cage. Owen couldn't stand it another minute. The only thing left to do was to holler, Rocket. You remember Rocket was the password for them to take off, so they all took off running, I'm sure. <laughs> Chapter 11. Just when Owen thought he could finally show Travis and Stumpy the submarine, Earlene's voice came thundering through the trees. Owen Jester! Dang! Owen peeked out from under the branches of the oak tree, tree teepee. Owen Jester! Dang, Owen said again, just when they had finally ditched Viola. Here was Earlene messing things up. Owen Jester! Earlene's voice was harsh and sharp. Coming, Owen hollered. Thunk, thunk, Owen kicked the leg of his chair. Swirl, swirl. He circled his fork around on his plate, leaving a trail in the cold gravy. But why can't I just go check on Thule, he said. His father shot him a stern glare. His mother let out a heavy sigh. Earlene harumphed by the stove. Owen hated Wednesday nights. On Wednesday nights, the Jesters went to Fort Creek Baptist Church for Bible study. Owen didn't care for Bible study. He could never remember the Bible passages that he was supposed to recite. He felt stupid acting out the parts in the Bible story skits. He hated standing in a circle around the piano singing hymns. Thunk, thunk. Owen kicked the leg of his chair again. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Owen glanced around him. All the other children were singing. Miss Nora Haskins was playing the piano. A couple of the goody-goody girls were clapping their hands and swaying from side to side. Owen tugged at the stiff collar of his shirt and moved his mouth, pretending to sing. He was good at pretending singing. Let it shine, let it shine, 
Let it shine. Owen's mind wandered. Actually, it wasn't so much wandering as it was darting back and forth. Sometimes his mind darted to Thule. Owen pictured the bullfrog sitting on the log inside the cage in the pond, all alone, sad. There was that niggling again. Other times, his mind darted to the submarine, the Water Wonder 4000, nestled there in the bushes below the train tracks. Then the niggling about Thule turned into a whirr of excitement about the submarine. Owen could hardly wait to show it to Travis and Stumpy, but here he was, standing in a circle, pretend sting singing. Amen, Miss Nora Haskins sang out with one last grand flourish of her fingers on the piano keys. Amen, all the other children echoed. Amen, Owen muttered under his breath. Tell Grandpa about the frog, Owen's mom, mother said. Um, well, Owen glanced at his grandfather's brown spotted hand resting on top of the pale blue blanket. Every now and then his gnarly fingers twitched. I finally caught that big old bullfrog down at Graham Pond. Owen's grandfather hadn't felt well enough to have visitors for a while, so Owen hadn't been able to tell him about Thule. He watched his grandfather's face. Was he sleeping? His grandfather took a wheezy breath in. He let a wheezy breath out. And me and Travis and Stumpy made a cage for him out of the chicken wire in the barn, Owen said. The stale air in the bedroom smelled like medicine and furniture polish. Owen's mother fiddled with the blanket and fluffed the pillows. Owen's grandmother, grandfather's mouth turned up a t teeny bit at the corners. A smile? His name is Thule Graham, Owen said. His grandfather drew in a sharp breath and let out a gravelly, huh. Then he opened his eyes and looked at Owen and nodded a little bit. Viola says he's sad, but you know how dumb she is. Owen, his mother frowned over at him. Well, she is, Owen's grandfather said, huh, again. So Owen spent the rest of the evening sitting beside his grandfather's bed, telling him about Thule. He told him how there was a little, a lot of bullfrogs in the Grand Pond, but Thule was the biggest and greenest and had a heart-shaped red spot between his eyes. He told him how, he told him about how long it had taken to catch him and how he had made the two frog houses, the inside out, the inside one and the outside one, and then the perfect chicken wire cage down in the pond. He told him about how he and Travis and Stumpy caught crickets and flies and mosquitoes for him and how Thule didn't seem to have much of an appetite. Owen's grandfather seemed to enjoy the conversation. He even chuckled one time. Owen told his grandfather everything he could think of to tell him. Except, he did not tell him about the Water Wonder 4000. That submarine was the biggest, most fantastic secret Owen had ever had in his whole life, and he wasn't sharing it with anyone except Travis and Stumpy. Owen was relieved when he finally saw the moon glowing in the darkening sky outside the bedroom window, signaling the end of the day. First thing tomorrow, Owen was taking Travis and Stumpy down to the tracks to see the submarine. Chapter 12. Whoa, Travis said, thwacking his forehead with the palm of his hand. Whoa, Stumpy said, arching his eyebrows in surprise. Owen crossed his arms and grinned. Know what it is, he said. Travis studied the little red submarine, peering in the windows, examining the scuba tanks. Stumpy walked around it, patted the smooth metal sides, pushing on the propeller in the back. It's a submarine, Owen said. Travis shook his head in wonder. Stumpy's jaw dropped. The three boys chattered excitedly as they examined the Water Wonder 4000. The rounded nose in front, the stubby wings with the propellers on the sides, the windowed compartment on top, the little propeller in the back, the scuba tanks. Owen climbed up onto one of the stubby little wings and then crawled into the top of the submarine, grinning down at Travis and Stumpy. He was sure he had never, not ever, not even once seen anything as perfectly, fantastically cool. He jumped down off the submarine, landed in the leaves with an oomph. Hey, wait a minute, he said. Where's the hatch? The hatch, Travis said. Yeah, you know, the hatch. Owen stood on tiptoe and ran his hands along the top. How do you get in this thing? The boys looked and felt and studied, and then Owen dropped to his hands and knees and examined the bottom of the submarine. There, he said, you crawl up in there, he pointed to an opening in the bottom. 
The three boys knelt in the dirt and weeds and peered into the opening. I'm going in, Owen said. He crawled in and pulled himself up inside the Water Wonder 4000. What's in there? Stumpy called through the opening. The inside of the submarine was small and cozy. There was just enough room for Owen to sit on one of the seats and reach the instrument panel in front. He touched the joystick, ran his fingers over the dials. Can you, can you see me? Owen called, pressing his face against the bubble-shaped window. Travis and Stumpy appeared beside the submarine and gave, gave Owen a thumbs up. Owen grinned at them. He tried to imagine being underwater, zipping along the ocean floor, maneuvering in and out of coral reefs, gliding among the dolphins, zooming up and down with the sharks. He let out a satisfied, ah, pure joy. But Owen's moment of joy came to a sudden screeching halt. Outside the window of the submarine, Travis and Stumpy were gesturing wildly, pointing up towards the train tracks and mouthing one word that Owen, in his moment of pure joy, most definitely did not want to hear. Viola. <laughs>